Well, uh, yeah, so let me begin by thanking the organizers for the invitation to speak at this uh, wonderful and exciting conference. This is my third week here, um, and it's definitely been a lot of fun. Uh, so in fact, a lot of what I want to talk about today in bits and pieces has appeared in some of the earlier talks. Uh, but I really want to ask a set of very focused questions in the context of these Moray superconductors, uh, which host these isolated flat bands, and specifically try to make some you know, general statements in this very non-perturbative regime, specifically with the hope of clarifying how to think about the electromagnetic response of these systems. And I guess I should say, you know, I'm going to be agnostic about whether or not these systems have or do not have quasi-particles, but importantly, in none of what follows, I'm ever going to appeal to any adiabatic continuity to the weakly interacting Fermi liquid. Everything that I'm going to talk about is going to be essentially exact. <clears throat> So let me actually thank all of the people who made all of this work possible. So much of the work has been done in collaboration with Dan Mao, who's a postdoc at Cornell and here in the audience, and Felipe, who's a grad student also at Cornell and is here in the audience. And I'm mostly going to focus on these works highlighted here. And if time permits, at the very end, I'm going to briefly mention some related work done in collaboration with Shui Peng Wang and Thomas Keeley, both grad students at Cornell and Johannes Hoffmann, who's been a longtime collaborator, specifically you know, on, on the study of these flat band systems using Monte Carlo, and Johannes is Eris' postdoc at Weizmann. Okay, so I don't think I need to tell this audience what motivates uh, the sort of questions that I'm going to address here. Of course, this is all inspired by the discovery of Moiré superconductivity, and I specifically want to focus on Moiré systems for reasons that will become clear in a second. And all of this has to do with trying to understand and maybe say some general remarks about what happens when you have interactions projected to a set of isolated flat bands at some partial filling. Okay, of course, the example that I've chosen here is specific to the non-interacting band structure of twisted bilayer graphene near magic angle, but you know, the details of this non-interacting band structure will be irrelevant, except the fact that I am dealing with some flat bands. So <clears throat> I would like to begin by just clearly stating what the starting point for this talk is going to be. I'm always going to be interested in the limit where the kinetic energy is completely quenched. We are dealing with flat bands, and every piece of the physics is just going to come from the projected interactions. Of course, with the understanding that I can, after saying something concrete about this problem, study the effect of perturbative uh, corrections due to the single particle kinetic energy that I had ignored to begin with. Now, it shouldn't be a surprise for you to realize that this is a complicated problem. These interactions can trigger multiple competing many-body states. And specifically, with the point of saying something about superconductivity, you know, there's no weak coupling or small parameter that justifies the use of VCS mean field theory. In fact, I will just briefly flash some results for essentially an exactly solvable toy model of flat bands with interactions where we show you know, VCS mean field theory just gives incorrect results. So instead, when you don't have this weak coupling type uh, technology available, what do you do? So for basically my entire talk, I'm going to leverage some useful analogies to a flat band problem that we really understand a lot about, which is the quantum Hall problem, and specifically also use some analogies to the problem of quantum Hall ferromagnetism. Again, I would like to emphasize for superconductivity, the topology associated with you know, the quantum Hall physics is not going to be essential. Again, something that we have demonstrated for you know, topologically trivial solvable models. And I don't want to talk about this, but this is something that excites me a lot because, as I said, this is a toy model that we have studied in collaboration with Johannes and Erez, where we can capture many of the elements that we think are also relevant for uh, you know, studying flat band models associated with twisted bilayer graphene, where the interactions generate a dispersion for the quasi-particles, lead to all kinds of intertwined instabilities, and so on. But I'm happy to talk about this offline later on. OK, so this is a short talk, and so I don't know if I'll get to the end of it. So let me just tell you at the outset what it is that I'm hoping to tell you about. So here's a cartoon band structure for the kinds of problems I'm dealing with. You have a set of isolated flat bands that are partially filled up to the chemical potential, which are separated from the remote dispersive bands. I'm going to be interested in the limit where the bandwidth goes to zero, and you have your interactions, which are smaller than the gap to these remote bands. 
The fundamental question that I want to address is, can we say something about the low energy electromagnetic response associated with these flat bands? In particular, the optical sum rule has made an appearance quite a bit in talks today. And so, of course, you know, if you look at this quantity and integrate over the entire spectrum, that's what gives us the usual F sum rule. But what I want to focus on is, is there something interesting that can be said about just the optical spectral weight associated with these interacting flat bands? And the answer is yes. And so first, that requires to introduce some theoretical formalism that correctly descri <coughs> sorry, describes this property. And then I'm going to apply this specifically to the problem of twisted bilayer graphene, again, in the completely flat band limit. And I would like to say something about the low energy optical spectral weight, which is shown here as the hatched region that does not include any of the interband transitions in a variety of correlated insulating states that show up at integer fillings associated with these flat bands. And you know, these are the various flavor polarized insulators with a many body gap. Um, let me also be clear, in today's talk, I'm only going to focus on you know, density density interactions, such as Coulomb interactions projected to these flat bands. But of course, we can extend this formalism also to say something about projected electron phonon interactions. OK, so why do we want to care about this question? Well, as has been pointed out in a number of papers, most recently in some beautiful work by Mohit's group, um, the optical spectral weight is useful for putting bounds, let's say, on the superconducting TC. So we are going to be interested in two-dimensional superconductors where TC is limited by the phase stiffness. And so this picture essentially conveys uh, one of the key ideas. You know, when uh, metal undergoes a superconducting transition, all of the subgap spectral weight has to be rearranged, which typically goes into the delta function, the coefficient of which precisely determines the superfluid stiffness. So if you want to address, you know, what is the highest TC you could ever get in a system, this is definitely going to be bounded by the entire optical spectral weight uh, in your system. Now, you know, generically speaking, in all electronic solids, this is a quantity that's of the order of electron volts. Now, I'm sure Mohit will have more to say about this in his talk tomorrow from the title of his talk, but I just want to sketch the approximate reasoning that goes into, uh, you know, getting some estimates for what this quantity is. So imagine you start with some generic multi-orbital correlated electronic system with many, many bands and some very generic hopping Hamiltonian that connects all of these different orbitals and some density-density interactions. Now, this can be a very complicated problem. What can we say about the optical spectral weight of this whole Hamiltonian? So the important thing to note here is that the way the interaction is written, of course, it does not couple to an external electron uh, potential. So the key quantity of interest is going to be this thing here, which I'm going to refer to as the diamagnetic susceptibility. It's the second derivative of the Hamiltonian in the presence of a weak external probe vector potential uh, with respect to the vector potential in the limit of a small a. Uh, so you can you know, do the usual thing. You have a real space Hamiltonian. You can do part substitution, couple your degrees of freedom to the vector potential, calculate this quantity, and then you come up with this very nice expression. The M inverse here is kind of reminiscent of an inverse mass. In fact, for a Galilean invariant problem, this exactly becomes, roughly speaking, the inverse mass. But in complicated multi-orbital systems, this is more complicated. And good. So once you have this, as they pointed out, you can put bounds on TC. Now, our problem is slightly different for the following reason. We are not interested, at least from the point of low energy physics, in the entire optical spectral weight associated with this problem. Because if you use this previous formalism and try to calculate this thing with the assumption that the interaction doesn't couple to the external vector potential, you have to include all of the different interband matrix elements and transitions to calculate this. And generically speaking, that is also going to give you that the total optical spectral weight, which is really the spectral weight associated with the original Dirac problem, of graphene is going to be bounded by you know, an energy scale that's order electron volts. Instead, you know, what we really want to understand, and this is not even the full story, as I said, I'm ignoring coupling to phonons and so on. This is you know, a caricature of the typical Hamiltonian that we are dealing with in this low energy subspace. So you have only your set of isolated flat bands with some kinetic energy. And then you have your projected density-density interactions 
where these rho tildes are the projected densities that depend on the actual form factors associated with the block wave functions of these flat bands. So imagine I gave you this sort of low energy momentum space Hamiltonian and asked you to calculate. Yes. Clarification question. Yes. Do you have to Coulomb interaction? Yes. Then the other bands will scream, like Ming Shi and other McDonald's. Yes, so it's. All the thousands of bands. Yeah. Are you including that somehow? Yes, so it's the screened Coulomb interaction field. So all those bands are included in, in this calculation. That's like a horrible numerical calculation. Yes, in principle, if you want to do everything right, you should do that and include the electron phonon with the projector phonon. Yes, <clears throat> so whatever there is, yeah, so whatever, you know, this is the true low energy effective theory. Now, <clears throat> just staring at this, if I asked you, um, you know, how do you introduce minimal coupling to this problem, it's a priori not obvious, specifically because the interaction term couples to the probe vector potential. And so the, most of this talk is going to be about say, saying something, or at least about the formalism of how you go about doing this. The punchline, of course, is that the low energy effective diamagnetic susceptibility and the effective current operator, they will both depend on the interactions. And part of this is related to Shankar's question. One really needs some kind of a systematic prescription to integrate out all of the effects of the high energy degrees of freedom and get the renormalized operators okay, for this theory. And, and it's kind of obvious once you think about it because the microscopic current operator and the diamagnetic susceptibility, they include matrix elements between the bands of interest and the remote bands. So if you're only interested in the physics of these flat bands, you have to figure out some consistent way of uh, integrating them out. And so I'm going to give you a very simple-minded, intuitive uh, argument for how to do that. Okay? So the important thing to note is, you know, let's just take a step back. If you have any Hamiltonian, really what we are doing when we are doing the uh, pile substitution is carrying out a unitary transformation. We are doing a gauge transformation, which boils down to doing a transformation of this type, where x is the many body position operator. Okay? So you do this unitary transformation associated all of the particles in your system. Rho is the, the actual thermal density matrix, if you wish. And you calculate the second derivative. And it takes this form of a double commutator of the Hamiltonian with respect to the many body position. Okay? Now, of course, if you have a Galilean invariant system with a parabolic dispersion, this is exactly what gives you the n over m. Okay? Now, if I just want to adapt this procedure to our problem of interest, one might approach in the following way. We know we have to project to the low energy effective Hamiltonian, which I'm going to describe here as this quantity here, so P is the projector that you build out of the block wave functions of the uh, target bands of interest, so you have that. And then you do the same gauge transformation that we did earlier and calculate the diamagnetic susceptibility. Now this is wrong. It's wrong because when you do this gauge transformation, what happens is you're going to create excitations between the, you know, your low energy subspace and your high energy degrees of freedom. Okay? This is something that in the quantum hall community people have known. The correct thing to do is to actually do a projected gauge transformation. So you take your projected Hamiltonian, you do a gauge transformation, but with the projected many body position operator. This ensures that everything that you have in your diamagnetic or effective diamagnetic susceptibility is expressed purely in terms of the low energy degrees of freedom. In fact, for the quantum hall experts, this is kind of reminiscent of the guiding center coordinate. Okay? And in fact, one could have guessed this form, you know, we first did the calculation, found this, and in hindsight it made perfect sense because in the problem there is an emergent conservation law. So, you know, of course you start out with the, in the problem with the total density being conserved, but in the low energy theory, the density associated just with your low energy flat bands, that's also conserved. And once you think about that, this is the natural gauge transformation you do, okay? So when the dust settles, the diamagnetic susceptibility is given by this double commutator of your projected Hamiltonian with the projected many body position operator. Okay, so it's, it's kind of beautiful. And if this was too quick and, and somewhat flaky, I mean, this is not how we did it, the correct way to do it is to set up some kind of a schieffer wolf transformation. Because again, remember what you want to do ultimately is eliminate all of these matrix elements that take you out of the low energy Hilbert space uh, into the excited states. And the systematic way to do that is to do this Schiffer-Wolf transformation, which again in the quantum hall setting for the correct effective current operator, 
was carried out a long time back, but I don't think anyone looked at this dam magnetic susceptibility back in the day. So, you know, the Schiffer Wolf transformation is really glorified second order perturbation theory where the expansion parameter is V over delta, delta being the gap to the remote bands. Okay. Now, the other interesting thing is once you have the renormalized dam magnetic susceptibility and the renormalized current operators, you can prove that there exists a partial F sum rule, which is the low energy optical conductivity integrated, you know, up to some energy scale that lies in the band gap that is given by the same dam magnetic response that I just told you about. Good. Now, you know, this double commutator looks uh, deceptively simple. Okay, this has this nice misleading sort of expression. If one wants to calculate this, it turns out, and I'm writing down only <clears throat> the contribution from the interactions, you have to evaluate these four fermion expectation values. Okay, so there are two pieces to this. There's the four fermion expectation value, and then there's a whole bunch of prefactors which depend on the form factors and various covariant derivatives of these form factors. So the A that you see here, it's the non-abelian Berry curvature, yeah, uh, Berry connection associated with uh, the band. So the other nice thing about this is, you know, I gave you uh, a low energy theory in momentum space. I can express the diamagnetic susceptibility in momentum space without ever having to think about, you know, going back and forth between real space and momentum space. So this is complicated. You know, if you want to evaluate this exactly, that's kind of hard unless you've already solved the problem. But if one is interested in, you know, just getting a sense of what is the maximum value that this ever takes, you can try to bound it. And again, this is something in a different, in a variety of different contexts has been done by Mohit's group. Uh, the, one of the questions we were interested in is, can we ever evaluate this exactly? And this is again where I come back to twisted violator graphene. Both of these plots have shown up in previous uh, talks today. So just to remind you in twisted violator graphene, you get all these sequence of insulating phases at integer fillings interspersed by domes of superconductivity. Okay, there's obviously differences between different samples. The insulators are really to be thought of as, I mean, at least in this strong coupling approach, as generalized quantum Hall ferromagnets or polarized insulators, as shown, uh, you know, in, in this plot here. So, if we pick any such insulator, there is a many-body gap. We can once again ask, what is the optical spectral weight associated with this specific many-body state? Okay. If you do not want to include contributions from the excitations to the remote bands, you can still ask within the manifold of flat bands, there are possibly intraband transitions, um, what is that spectral weight? This is interesting because if you think about these insulating states potentially as parent states of superconductivity and perhaps some strange metallic transport, you would want to know what is this optical spectral weight. And amazingly, okay, so one of the reasons why this calculation can be done is that at the end of the day, these insulating phases, they're essentially like slater determinant states. Okay, so if you think about their single particle density matrix, they have this very simple form in terms of these projectors uh, whose analytical form we know very well, at least in this so-called chiral flat band limit. I'm not going through the details here. This is uh, probably going a little too fast, but yeah, I'm happy to explain this later. But um, so these are slater determinant states. I had to evaluate some four fermion correlation functions. I can do that easily using Bix's theorem. This becomes especially apparent once I just take this form of the double commutator and express it in a slightly different way as the double commutator of the projected uh, many body position with the actual density matrix. It turns out that in this special chiral limit where you can you know, label all the states in the churn band basis, this commutator just vanishes identically, okay? So what this tells you is that in this particular limit, there is no intraband transition if you shine light, okay? That is the consequence of the fact that this um, projected many body position operator essentially commutes with the projector which is labeled by these churn numbers of the different degrees of freedom. Of course, this is an artifact of the particular limit that we are dealing with, which tells you that there are just no allowed dipole transitions between these filled and empty states in the projected low energy theory. If you try to go away from this sort of solvable chiral flat band limit, 
for instance, by turning up this genetic term that we had initially ignored, you can also convince yourself that the correction scales as t squared over u. Okay. Now, this is, you know, the extent of what can be said exactly. If you really want to do a better job and include sort of all the realistic corrections, you know, there are lots of, you know, good candidate states. One of the popular ones these days being the incommensurate Kekulé spiral. You can sort of do that within some self-consistent Hartree fog and calculate this, but of course at that point you have made some approximations. Okay. So that is all that I wanted to say. Yeah, and I'm almost ready to finish. So, you know, most of this talk was really trying to, you know, take a step back from trying to make some detailed predictions about which superconducting state is stabilized where and what does it depend on as trying to put some general bounds on uh, one important quantity. In parallel, we've also been studying, again, some kinds of toy models which capture some elementary details of the twisted biolegraphene. One particular interesting example that we have recently been studying is really take a model of time reversed copies of churn bands with some intra valley ferromagnetic interactions and inter valley anti ferromagnetic interactions. And there's a whole range of parameter space where this model does not suffer from the sign problem. And, you know, we are trying to finish this paper where we show some competition between different kinds of ordering tendencies ranging from superconductivity to inter valley orders. And, you know, I just want to end by flashing this uh, somewhat unrelated but inspired by Moray TMD's project, uh, which I'm very excited about and I really want to convey the excitement to the experimentalists in the audience. So in a, quite a few different Moray TMDs which form this triangular Moray uh, lattice, um, various groups have shown the emergence of wigner mott insulators. In particular, I would like to focus my attention on these insulators that show up at two-fifths charge or one-fifth electron filling of the Moray unit cell, where there is very clear signature of an insulating state. So we recently did some DMRT analysis of this and found that, you know, the insulating state itself is like a crystal of spin singlets. The spin singlets get stabilized because of some uh, nearest neighbor exchange that is generated between the localized charges. And while we were interested in studying, you know, the quantum melting of this problem for other reasons, what we found is that if you just, at fixed filling, try to crank up the ratio of hopping over interactions, you know, eventually the system has to become metallic, but there is an intermediate phase which is like a strongly fluctuating superconductor. So the interesting thing here is that, you know, before these singlets break apart as you crank up T, the singlets become mobile and the system becomes like a superconductor. So this is a very all repulsion way of getting a superconductor. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Dipajan, may I ask you a question related, but not that directly related to what you are talking about? This is a question about how to get superconductivity in this system. You need attraction generally. And more specific question is this. You start with a model with repulsive screen Coulomb interaction. You can add phonons, but if you only deal with narrow band, then it's anti-adiabatic regime in this sense, right? The bandwidth is so narrow. So do you have any idea how in this situation you still can get attraction starting from repulsion plus anti-adiabatic regime plus possibly phonons? Are you talking specifically about this problem? No, or more no, generally. generally. Uh, because you have title superconductivity. Uh, no, I don't have any strong opinions. I'm open to it being some combination of unconventional phonon mediated attraction plus some repulsion. My point is we should not be thinking about that starting from the weak coupling limit because, you know, in this limit of flat bands with projected interactions, it's a different problem. I don't have a solution, but... Right, but in the limit which you call weak coupling, at yes. least there is a possibility to start with repulsion and then via generic conlattice mechanism create attraction in some other channels. Here you, you don't allow this mechanism because of bandwidth is zero. Right, but you know, there are other mechanisms that people have proposed, like I don't want to go into this. For instance, you know, there are ways to avoid that, like the skirmion mediate mechanism is mm -hmm. one example, but... Okay. Wouldn't you also uh, planaralize phonons down or because of folding? Could be. I'm just asking. So, 
I want to clarify to get the projected operator, the position operator, do you need to know in advance that the wave function of the full Hamiltonian on the, like, projected, the wave function of the narrow bands from diagonalizing the whole Hamiltonian? Right, that's a good point. Yes, we do. And then you might ask, which wave function do we use? The one from the original non-interacting one, or do we renormalize that further? And, you know, in principle, you can renormalize the wave functions as well using the same tree for both transformation and, you know, shows the self-consistency loop. But yes, you need to know the form factors. I see. Thank you. So, yeah, going more or less in the direction that Andre was mentioning, right? So if I, you talk about electron-electron interactions and how to project them, but I can also think of projecting the electron-phonon interaction, because I'm going to have a lot of phonons whose energies are tiny because of the folding. So does it, does it, how do I reconcile? If I think of I'm going to have a low energy phonon, I would say, okay, I can have conventional superconductivity because the phonon energy is much smaller than the, than the width of the band. But in your approach, it seems that no matter what interaction I have, I'm bound to get zero superfluid density. So, or maybe I'm confusing. So given that there have been two questions on this, let me just clarify what it is that I'm saying. First of all, I'm only looking at this optical spectral weight and trying to estimate this. Even if this optical spectral weight is finite, I can't guarantee that you're going to get a superconductor out of it. All that it says is TC is going to be bounded by whatever optical spectral weight there is. The second point is, you know, this is the optical spectral weight at the insulating filling. Once you dope away from it, of course, at the insulator, you're not going to get a superconductor, even if this was finite. Once you dope away from it, you're going to change. This is just the starting point. You're going to get some additional optical spectral weight. There's going to be a Drude-like peak that's going to emerge. We are not solving that problem because I don't think anyone really has a non-perturbative solution to what the many-body ground state is once you dope away from the insulators. But yes, indeed, once you add the coupling to the electron phonons, that's going to have introduced some additional features. It's going to change the story. But if you only look at the deformation potential coupling, not the gauge phonons, I think the story at integer fillings that I've just told you, that still survives. That's guaranteed by the structure of that deformation potential coupling. Shankar? Let me, I have a question and a comment. Uh, maybe I'll make the comment first. So my prediction is that in TMD, superconductivity will not be seen. The reason is, I think superconductivity is arising from electron phonon interaction. I know, in you've TMD, that before. is very, very weak. Right. And you know, this is a prediction I'll stick to until it's seen, then, then of course I'll change my right. opinion very fast. Okay. Uh, but, but my question, yeah. the, uh, the theory that you proposed, can I, I did not follow everything in detail. Can I think of it as a generalized F sum rule, a generalized optical sum rule for this system, which is very complicated, but it seems like you have pulled yes, it. Is yes. that a correct way of thinking about it yes. or wrong? So, so I have response to both your comment and to your question. So yes, I don't know if TMDs are ever going to find superconductivity, but at least, you know, this exercise um, motivated by superconductivity just accidentally led us to the situation where you get, I mean, this is almost, you know, like RVB, you get these spin singlets, and then when you introduce quantum fluctuations, the singlets themselves become mobile. So if this, you know, the good thing is they already have these insulators in TMDs. I, uh, regarding your point, indeed, this is a partial F sum rule, but it's somewhat non-trivial because all of these objects, the susceptibilities, are renormalized by interactions. So it, a priori, it's not obvious that such a low energy optical sum rule exists in the first place, but it turns out it does. Yeah. Hello. Should the interactions induce any dispersion in these flat bands? I, I, where am I looking? Ah, yes. But do you treat them always as flat? No, no. So the initial sort of BM dispersion is treated to be flat. The projected interactions that generate everything, they are fully treated. Thank you. We are not throwing out the interaction generated dispersion. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions? Let's thank Jibajan then.